Uh, welcome to another week and quarter of the Behavior Evolution and Culture Speaker Series. We meet every week of the academic year at this time in this place. There's a sign-up sheet going around and that helps us keep track of how many people are coming and um, uh, tell that to all the wonderful sponsors who I'll talk about in a moment. So please, if you haven't already done so, sign that when it comes around. Uh, I want to take a moment just to thank our sponsors. Um, so I will list them now. They are the Cochin Institute of Archaeology, the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, the Department of Communication Studies, and um, an additional sponsor of the Department of Anthropology. So um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, today's speaker after just giving you a brief preview of what we have coming up. So next week, Angela Garcia is coming from, An uh, from Arizona State University. The title of her talk is The Embodiment of Stress. Do diurnal cortisol immune interactions and parasitic infection moderate social influences on health among immigrant women in Utila? Um, the following week, Nandita Garud, who's a new uh, faculty member in EEB, um, will be coming. Um, she's a population geneticist. Uh, February 4th, Courtney Meehan from Washington State University, and Melanie Martin from University of Washington, Josh Schnodgrass from University of Oregon, Dan Hrushka from Arizona State, and uh, the last speaker for the quarter is Raziel Davison from the University of California, Santa Barbara. So that's what we have coming up this quarter. I'm very pleased to introduce Dan Blumstein, uh, who's uh, here at UCLA in the Department of Ecology and Evolution and Biology. And we'll be talking about the sound of the year. It's always really fun to come and share what I'm doing with you guys. And um, what I want to do today is really ask a general question. Is there a universal sound of fear? Are there universal emotions that transcend species? And I want to sort of get at this question by um, first going deep into marmots for a bit. Marmots are big ground squirrels found around the northern hemisphere. There are 15 species. I've studied eight of the 15 species and looked at alarm communication in these things. And, you know, marmots are marmots are marmots. They kind of look the same. Many of them live in um, nice environments, which is nice. They have a nice aesthetic sense. They, they, they conform to the academic calendar, hibernating during the winter. Um, I confirmed that in Colorado right now, they are under several meters of snow, and, you know, that was really important to do. Um, and, you know, uh, and then they're, and they're not primates, yet they vary quite a bit in their degree of social complexity, their communicative complexity, and other things. So they make a good model system for studying things. Also, unlike primates, they have an address. Marmots are burrowing rodents. They're big ground squirrels. So, you know, and they're diurnal, so you can find them. They live in a place. You know where they live. You can mark them and, and, and follow them. Um, of course, as you know, we have a holiday um, about marmots it's called Groundhog Day. Not only that, it's about weather and it's about and it's about animal behavior. So what you know, what more can one um, hope for? This is the only holiday about animal behavior and about animals, really, that we celebrate. Turkey Day does not count. That's about you know slaughtering turkeys, but this is about using their prognosticating abilities to to to, to learn about our, our weather. We have a Groundhog Day party every year. We're going to do it on a Friday this year, Friday the first in my lab. Everyone's welcome. Um, you know. Um, we celebrate um, marmots and pull out this poor groundhog on Pux's Honey Phil on Groundhog Day. Um, but in general, we, we make fun of them in the U.S. We parody, parody them. But that's not true in, in Europe where they make, you know, amazing statues in Zermatt to, to marmots to celebrate marmots. And, 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 you know, you can say, okay, fine, you know, folk wisdom, whatever. But it turns out a number of species are endangered and critically endangered. And so in the past, I've worked with Vancouver Island marmots, which were brought back from extinction, where there were about 30 or so living in, in the wild to about 150 to 200 living now through captive breeding and reintroduction. So marmots. I want to take uh, uh, I want to take a Tinbergian view of thinking about alarm calls and the evolution uh, function, causation, and meaning of alarm calls. And then I want to sort of think about reliability assessment and ask the questions, do marmots cry wolf? Not in a referential way, but are they, are they um, lying, essentially? And then think about individuality and the importance of reliability assessment. I want to then segue to fear screams. Fear screams aren't alarm calls, and I'll define both of these in moments, um, and talk about a general hypothesis that I call the nonlinearity and fear hypothesis. And then I want to transition, um, because marmots are active only during you know, the summer months, and I'm here the rest of the year, um, to sort of studying people. And this is in part in collaboration with Craig Bryant and others. So we'll have a Hollywood ending to this. Um, so 
If you walk through your favorite environment with a dog, um, you probably start hearing animals chirp chirping, whistling, and trilling at you, and these are alarm calls. These alarm calls could be directed to predators to signal detection, um, and therefore for uh, species that require um, sort of crypsis to get close to their prey um, to discourage pursuit, because once, once you're detected, the game's up. Um, but they also could be directed to conspecifics, to warn kin, or to create pandemonium. And what's interesting about this is these are not mutually exclusive. Calls can serve both functions. They can um, alert predators that they've been detected, and they can um, warn kin and other individuals, conspecifics. And there's a you know, huge literature on kin selection. Alarm calling is one of those uh, sort of paradigmatic studies of kin selection in, 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 in animals. And you know, then the question is, well, how do you sort of tease these apart? And I spent a lot of time trying to think about how to tease apart the relative importance of one versus the other in current systems, and I've sort of failed at doing that because they're, mutually, they're not mutually exclusive. But we can look at rodents in general, and we can reconstruct the evolutionary origin of alarm calling in 209 species of rodents, which is what we did. And what we found was that the evolutionary origin of alarm calling was not associated with the evolutionary origin of sociality, but rather the evolutionary origin of diurnality. So if you're calling in the dark, you don't really know what's going on around you. So it's by, and, and maybe by calling, you make yourself more vulnerable. Remember, you find animals in the wild because they're alarm calling. I find animals in the wild because they're alarm calling. So predators are using these things to find animals in, in the wild as well. So they're potentially risky. But rather, um, when, 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 when animals evolve diurnality, alarm calling um, evolves after that. And that suggests that once animals can sort of begin to manage risk in ways where they can assess risk and call appropriately, that maybe these calls are directed to predators, or at least is consistent with that hypothesis. So all of this stuff we're studying now about the kin-selected functions of alarm calling and kin selection and other things, probably are, ex are an exaptation in sort of the Stephen Gouldian sense that alarm calling probably initially evolved to um, be directed to predators and then has been accepted to have a conspecific warning function. So you guys are in for a treat. We're going to listen to like all of the marmots, or 14 of the marmots, um, alarm calls. And we're going to have a little sing-along. Um, and that's, that's kind of important. Now, there are 15 species of marmots. One species of marmot is one of those cryptic species. You can't make this stuff up. In the former Soviet Union, there's an area that has naturally high levels of background radiation. And people found, a, you know, a gene, not, not just a, a genetically, a chromosomally unique marmot species that lives within the whole range of another species, probably because of this, you know, cryptic genetic variation. I don't have alarm calls from those, but I have alarm calls from everything else. And we're going to do a sing-along. And, you know, what I want you to think about is we think about, you know, diversity of vocalizations, right? And when we think about diversity of vocalizations, we think about sexual selection. Sexual selection, um, you know, and, and species identification, right? We think about selection to make species have species-specific signals. Except when we think about alarm calls, because then if we go back and read Peter Marler and listen to birds, we find that lots of birds have convergent vocalizations, at least North American and European birds, have convergent vocalizations whereby, um, uh, their, their, their alarm calls sound kind of similar. But here we see, and we'll hear, remarkable diversity. Let's go roughly from top to bottom. Huh. I don't have mirrored on. Oh, well. Himalayana. Siberica. Kamchatka. Babacina. Bobak. Kaudata, Mensbury, Browerai, Marmota, normal, and then start high, Monax. That's the groundhog. I've never heard one of those. Olympus, an ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Caligata, an ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Vancouverensis, ascending, descending, 
flat, key all, trill. Flap of interest, a whistle and then a trill. That's the dog uh, breathing that I was using to elicit those vocalizations. So remarkable acoustic divergence from something in other systems that tend to be more convergent. So what explains um, both repertoire size variation and what explains acoustic variation? So in marmots, more socially complex species produce more alarm call types. Um, marmots vary from uh, having their offspring disperse in their first year of life, like woodchucks, or they may have multi-generation family groups um, with all sorts of interesting reproductive dynamics like some of the European species um, hanging out together. Turns out the acoustic environment does not explain variation in repertoire size. So if you look at um, and quantify how calls are transmitted in different environments, there are good environments and there are good call types that are transmitted well, but there isn't this, uh, the interaction that one would expect if the acoustic adaptation hypothesis explained this. The number of predators a species has doesn't seem to explain everything. All marmots are eaten by um, raptors and terrestrial felids and canids, and um, many of them are dug up by things as well, like bears or badgers. And if you sort of argue by analogy and look at uh, island populations of ground squirrels that uh, are isolated for different numbers of years from the mainland, you begin to get divergence in call structure after about 8 to 10 to 12,000 years. So it's likely that it's, what matters is having a functional alarm call and that maybe drift processes can explain some of the variation in the actual acoustics. So that's sort of the evolution of alarm calling. Um, and I've done studies with this also, some of these questions asking these questions also in ground squirrels and prairie dogs and marmots as well, and they hold up. More social species have more call types. So I spend a lot of time in Colorado these days running a long-term project at a place called the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. RMBL um, is a high-altitude independent field station located near Crested Butte, Colorado. And Ken Armitage, in 1962, started ident mark marking and following individual marmots. Remember, Jane Goodall started in 1960. This is one of the longest-running studies where the fate of individual animals has been um, tracked through time. And I've been running it since 2001. So we ask a number of questions in the system. We ask all sorts of questions about climate change and it's getting it warmer, the marmots are coming out earlier, there are interesting interactions between sociality and um, the environmental variation. We're looking at all sorts of um, heritable and studying phenotypic plasticity. We're now doing a bunch of questions looking at longevity and correlates of longevity. But what I want to talk today about and focus on are, are sort of alarm, is alarm communication and, and fear screams. So you can ask a approximate question, what makes animals alarm call? And for this, we can capitalize on the fact that yellow-bellied marmots, not unlike many other species, but yellow bellies particularly, um, vary in their propensity to call. So just because you emit an alarm call, it, alarm calls aren't reflexively produced when animals see predators. Animals are sort of figuring out what's going on before they elect to, to call. But we can ask what potentiates this um, in, a, in a much more proximate and physiological way. So what we did was, we noted that um, when we walk towards an animal in a trap, uh, individuals have some probability of calling. And it turns out the same individuals that are more likely to call when we walk to them in a trap are also more likely to call if we walk to them if they're just outside. And it turns out that these are the individuals that when a predator comes through, they're more likely to call as well. So we're going to use, since we trap these animals regularly, we're going to use what we call a trap calling assay as a metric of the propensity to emit calls. Now, we collect everything we can collect with when we catch, capture these animals. I think it's a privilege to be able to study animals in the wild. I don't fool myself into believing that we have no impacts. Um, so I want to learn as much as, as we can. We trap these animals throughout their lives. We have near zero mortality um, and near zero injury rates. Every once in a while, an animal you know, succumbs for whatever reason, um, but that's really rare. So we're trying to keep these animals alive. We're not trying to harm them, et cetera. So what we do is we also collect feces when they defecate. And what we did was we compared fecal glucocorticoid metabolites for, 20, in this analysis, 29 breeding age females who called on one occasion, but they didn't call on another occasion. And then we said, well, what differs between these occasions? And what we found was that when an individual called, she had systematically higher glucocorticoid metabolite levels than on an occasion when she didn't call. We might be able to infer from this that stress levels 
background basal stress levels potentiate alarm calling in marmots. And this parallels findings in other species where people have done manipulative experiments blocking court functioning um, by injecting various court blockers and finding that that changes um, propensity to call in things like rhesus macaques. So think about this. Individuals may di differ in their propensity to call. They may differ in their baseline glucocorticoid levels. Um, and, and, and think about this when we come to thinking about reliability and mechanisms of reliability, um, what might account for differences in individuals. So then we can, in our, you know, Tinbergian march through uh, levels and questions, we can say, well, what do calls mean? Well, what could they mean? Well, calls could communicate the degree of risk. What's that mean? That means that if, um, rather than different predators eliciting different calls, the same predator could elicit different degrees of risk. So for example, if I'm really close um, to a predator or a predator is really close to me, that might be more scary than if a predator is far away. And that could account for and explain variation in calling. Similarly, response urgency or distance to predator could, could, could sort of, you know, um, be involved in communicating degree of risk. Functional reference. And these, these calls, and, and indeed, I started studying um, alarm communication in marmots when the NIH had this like amazing call for proposals years ago. This was like a one-off. Um, and they said, we're interested in studying the biological basis of things we're interested in. And I said, I'm interested in getting a postdoc. And uh, so I sort of wrote an NRSA and got funded to, you know, march around the world and study marmot alarm communication because these calls um, could be functionally referential. They could communicate um, types of predators. They could be nouns. They could be labels for predator types. And what was important was um, some species of marmots had been suggested to have functionally referential communication, while other species were suggested not to. And that's interesting. And I sort of said, well, I'm interested in understanding the evolutionary basis of, of, of language, and maybe understanding this, the evolution of this ability would be a, a good thing to do. So functional reference means that um, calls are specifically associated, the production of calls, you know, think Cheney and Seyfarth's Burbit monkey stuff. The production of calls are specifically and uniquely associated with a particular type of predator. Raptors lead to one sort of acoustically distinct call. Um, terrestrial predators lead to another acoustically distinct call, whatever. And then if you broadcast these calls, you get unique responses that are raptor specific or terrestrial predator specific. Now, you know, this is a dichotomy, but it's clearly a false dichotomy. We have both. Um, uh, we, in, our, in, our, in our own communication, we can communicate both about degree of risk and functional reference. You know, fire or fire, you know, means two different things. Um, and, you know, in the coolest animals on earth, meerkats, we know that meerkats uh, uh, have a bit of both too, as Marta Manser has shown. So we spend a lot of time in the field observing and eliciting calls. We have our armamentaria fear, which include things like robo-badger. Marmots really don't like badgers. We have Eagle Knievel named because um, if you're of a certain age, you remember who Evil Knievel was, who was this like nutcase who would like put himself on rocket-propelled motorcycles and launch himself across canyons and rarely make it across and then spend the next, you know, year in body casts and then, you know, get out and rehabilitate himself and do it again and then spend the next year in body casts. Eagle Knievel, we would fly this radio control, this is before drones, we'd fly this radio controlled glider um, and marmots live in alpine areas. Alpine areas are characterized by talus and rocks. So you get the thing flying, you scare the shit out of all these marmots and then you can't land it without breaking it. So then you sort of spend a lot, and, you know, and as you put it in the Eagle Knievel in his body cast, he gets heavier and heavier and flies faster and faster and crashes harder and harder, and it's sort of a, a race to the bottom. So in any event, um, we collected a bunch of data and scared a bunch of animals, and what we found was um, that, you know, first, don't believe anything you read if you're a graduate student or anything else, um, because if you have cr rigorous criteria about what these animals are saying, um, particularly with respect to functional reference, marmots don't have functional referential alarm calls, at least by my definitions and the definitions I applied. However, so we, this is not a good system to study the evolution of, of, of linguistic abilities necessarily. But as a biologist, this is pretty cool. Look at all these mechanistic variation. Look at all this mechanistic variation. So we know that they have different numbers of alarm calls. You heard them. But they also communicate risk in different ways. Sometimes they change the rate as risk gets higher. As you get closer, some species call faster. Interesting, maybe making themselves more conspicuous. Some species call um, slower. Some species package their calls. If you're 300 meters away and the marmot starts calling, the golden marmots in Pakistan would start calling at me about 300 meters away. Um, 
you know, you get a 12 note call. As you get closer and closer and closer and closer, you get eight note, six note, five note, four notes, and then they're gone. So, you know, there's all sorts of variation. The Vancouver Island marmot that almost went extinct, um, I would say has phonological syntax. I mean, we don't really want to lose a species that has syn syntactical abilities. Um, this is something that's kind of rare in, in non-humans. But no species has functionally referential abilities. Okay, so let's move on. And let's think about and, and drill down and think more about yellow-bellied marmots. So yellow-bellied marmot alarm calls contain information, potential information about age, sex, and identity. Make a bunch of measurements on the calls and, and you, know, you find associations with all of these things. They can make some of these discriminations. But the real question is, what's this identity signaling? What's going on with identity signaling? Why would anyone want to produce individually distinctive vocalizations? Well, you know, in the literature, there are examples of, in, in the diversity of life around us, there are examples of species producing group or territorial calls or contact calls. Fred, Mabel, Fred, Mabel. And maybe these are good for keeping individuals together and knowing who's around. Um, of course it makes sense if you're a crushing animal, you leave your kid somewhere to be able to find your kid. Mom, Junior, Mom, Junior. All sorts of good reasons there should be selection on the producer to produce individually distinctive calls and the receiver to discriminate among different calls. But alarm calls provide a bit of a quandary. Why produce individually distinctive alarm calls? You can always say invoke kinship. Maybe it's to invoke kinship. You know, maybe kinship's important and this is how they know who's calling. But, but they don't really call much. I mean, I, we go whole days without hearing any alarm calls. We go weeks without hearing alarm calls. I mean, you know, they, individuals are likely to call if there's a predator around, but they don't necessarily call if there's a predator around. So, you know, animals may have long spells where they hear no alarm calls. So if kinship recognition was important, presumably there'd be a different signal for that. So a lot of people had suggested that caller reliability was important. And they did um, a number of studies to, to look at this, and I was sort of feeling critical and decided that I wasn't happy with a lot of these studies. And, and the idea really is that um, if you have the fable, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, um, if you remember the fable, The Boy Who Cried Wolf, um, if animals cry wolf too many times, if they're not reliable, then the idea is that um, calls from unreliable individuals should be discounted. And again, this makes a lot of sense, but if you look really critically at the methods people have been using to, to, to infer this, I was a little grumpy. So I said, let's design a really good experiment. But a really good experiment is kind of invasive, and we work really hard not to hurt our animals. And what we had to do was we had to do a learning experiment. We had to do a learning experiment where we really wanted to sort of habituate animals to alarm calls. And, you know, that started ringing bells and whistles in my um, ethical um, uh, you know, neurons, because the last thing I wanted to be doing was to make these animals not responsive to alarm calls. So by design, we went in with a rather small sample size. This was hard to do. We had to pretest individuals, and we had to then expose them to different calls from different individuals. Then we had to post-test individuals. And really, this is a formal learning experiment, where we're looking at after minus before, you know, control treatment, and seeing if there's a difference in whether animals could be trained to learn um, about a reliable individual. And our reliable individuals were those that were exposed to, um, uh, for 10 minutes, to a badger. We took his wheels off and we had him covered and we uncovered him with a tarp and we hosed the meadow for 10 minutes with rapidly paced alarm calls, different alarm calls from a given individual. We had different individuals we were training these with, so we had good inference space. And then our control was different individuals' calls was paired with the badger, but we never pulled off the tarp. So if there were any response to a bump in the meadow, or maybe the taxidermic mounted badger smelled bad, or whatever, we would control for that. So it's a hardcore learning experiment. So the boy who cried wolf, and, and for all of these experiments I'm going to be talking about, what we do is we bait animals to a location. And animals generally can trade off vigilance and foraging. But because we have them foraging during our baseline period and then, you know, we test them with something, what we're really looking for is a decline in foraging behavior. And that typically is traded off with locomotion and a lot of vigilance. Now, I will say that all animals initially respond, and then for some of these experiments I'm talking about, these responses attenuate over time. But if the boy who cried wolf hypothesis, which is what everyone was saying, explains variation in um, or explains why animals um, have individually distinctive calls, then we would expect animals 
the, the reliable individuals to elicit less foraging because they you know, weren't habituated, right? And, and maybe you know, more looking. And we're gonna focus here on foraging. And what we found was the exact opposite. Marmots foraged more while hearing the reliable caller. Small sample size, I don't know if you like p-values or don't like p-values. I don't believe any single experiment, including my own. Let's do some more studies. Um, but the point is that unreliable callers weren't ignored. So there are multiple lines of evidence that reliable individuals is essentially are discounted, which is interesting and contradicts the Boyer-Cried wolf hypothesis. As I just said, marmots forage more while hearing a caller artificially made reliable. Marmots forage more while hearing undegraded and therefore presumably higher risk calls. Marmots forage more after hearing calls from older animals as opposed to unreliable pups. Degradation, forgot to mention that. So, all signals degrade over distance, right? So um, the fidelity goes down, the amplitude goes down over distance. And if you're really close to a producer, you're close to someone who's scared. And if you're close, and animals are really good at detecting and estimating distance based on these degradational cues. So the idea by degrading, by broadcasting, re-recording, and then broadcasting these vocalizations back to the marmots, the idea was that we could sort of simulate um, a caller being close to an animal versus being far from an animal. And the idea if an animal is close to the caller, then um, it presumably is sharing the risk that, that caller has. But if there's more uncertainty when an individual is far from a caller, and we play these back at the same amplitude. You had a question? Yeah, I, just, I wanted to know a little bit about um, what, you, what data you have on the base rates of sort of false positives and false negatives. Really, really difficult, which is why we're doing all of this experimentally. So um, marmots, you know, call, the modal number of calls is one, and you look up and there's a bunch of poker faced marmots looking at you. So if they call more than once, then we have a chance of identifying the caller. Um, predators come through, not everyone calls. Um, a lot of the calls are not to predators. So, you know, they don't like deer for some reason. I'm wondering if deer look like long-legged mountain lions. I don't know. Or maybe they just don't want to have to monitor deer. But, you know, we've had 600 calls, uh, you know, elicited from a deer. Um, so we can't study this observationally, so we sort of went in by design and studied it experimentally. Great question, wish I could do it. Anyway, so they forage more while hearing these undergraded calls, these higher risk calls than, than the lower risk calls. Um, and this, all of these are sort of exactly opposite to studies of vervet monkeys, bonnet and rhesus macaques, steppe marmots, riches and ground squirrels, that all found that individuals foraged less or looked more after hearing calls from reliable individuals. So multiple lines of evidence, same same take home message. So why do marmots seemingly discount calls from reliable individuals? Scratch my head about this for a while. And if you sort of twist it around a bit, at least and go into sort of, you know, Dan logic, um, which maybe isn't so logical, but I'll see what you think. Um, maybe unreliable individuals or situations are unreliable specifically because it's difficult to assess the true risk of predation. And if that's true, then maybe these unreliable calls and situations should elicit independent investigation. In other words, if you don't really know, remember, they all look initially, and then they get back to what they were doing. And it's almost as though when they hear a reliable individual, they look and they say, oh, you know, I trust you, you made a mistake, I don't see anything, and they get back to it. But if they hear an unreliable individual, or unreliable situation, they spend more time looking around because they don't know. They don't know if, if there's something there or not. And what could account for these variations in reliability? Well, maybe baseline glucocorticoid levels. They're nervous Nellies and cool hand Lucy's. <coughs> nervous Nelly, you know, alarm calls at the drop of a leaf. You don't know if it's a leaf or it's a raptor, but you know when cool hand Lucy calls, there's a raptor around, or a fox around, or a, um, uh, or a, a coyote around. So again, um, sort of thinking more broadly and biologically, I think we should generally expect evolutionary flexibility and mechanisms of communication, and I think we see it here. And to me, this, I, I like sort of uh, throwing out the tagline, I want to study the evolutionary ecology of this, which means I want to know what explains differences in this mechanistic variation. Why do some species discount um, uh, why do some species sort of play the, the, the uh, the, the game of, uh, uh, of the boy who cried wolf, whereas other species don't. 
So there's variation there, and how do we explain this? And really, to explain this, we need to look at lots of different species, and we need to understand the evolutionary life history, or we need to understand the life history and natural history correlates of this mechanistic variation. And I think that's where this field needs to go next. I'm not aware of other people that have found and reported this sort of a finding, um, and most people have reported the, the, the sort of boy who cried wolf ideas. So I'm a convert now. I went in critically thinking about this, not expecting to, to, to be convinced that it's all about you know, reliability assessment, but I'm, I'm convinced that reliability assessment is likely to be a general explanation for the evolution of the ability to discriminate among alarm callers. And again, the question is, well, how does it work and why? So shifting gears a bit, we know that context is everything in behavior, in life, and behavioral ecologists, that's our sort of, you know, bread and butter, trying to understand context. And we know that the sound of fear is very site-specific. So for here, example, you know, this might be the sound of fear in LA. Whereas where I work in Colorado, that's the sound of fear. That's a baby marmot um, a, giving a fear scream. They do this rarely. They do it only um, within about the first nine days of after emergence from their natal burrow. And the first time I heard this, remember, we try not to hurt these animals. I'm cradling this little baby and it lets out this terrific scream and I almost dropped it. I'm like, I broke it, what did I do? And, you know, and I had this emotional response. And I was wondering, I don't get emotional responses to alarm calls. What's going on with this? Baby marmots can alarm call from the day they come out of their burrow, but they only do this for about nine days, sometimes. And interestingly, when they do that, mom comes up. Mom has big teeth, comes out of the burrow and looks at us, gets real close. That, they never do that when, when they alarm call. So there's something going on with this. Um, what's going on with this? So, you know, the first thing you do is you sort of read Darwin, and Darwin says, screams or calls for assistance that young animals give to solicit aid from their parents. Now, what was really fascinating was, um, you know, I am, I've been alive before Google and before the web. And when Darwin first came online in some weird way, what was it called? Uh, what was that web, the, the web, the, the browser? I mean, it wasn't the web, but you could sort of look and everything became digitized and you could go and you could look and I'm like, does Darwin know marmots? Darwin did not know marmots, but Darwin knew, knew fear and he knew fear screams. So Darwin talked about screams. Screams are generally emitted from highly aroused animals. And the question you can then ask is, are these typical alarm calls or not? So we know that they kind of sound a little different, and we'll talk about this in a moment. Alarm calls typically have simple harmonic structure. These are calls from two different adult females. And if you look carefully at them, um, the structure of them is a little different. This descends a little, you know, this is more symmetrical. Um, this is what I mean by the differences between the structure of these alarm calls. You also know these are really short calls, and marmots can distinguish these calls. They can learn, they can tell them apart. So what's interesting is, I, I think you, know, you can answer, you can end any phrase, but what about meerkats? And if you do that, you know, you're probably on a good um, path to discovery. But what about meerkats? Well, meerkats are interesting because they actually have functionally referential vocalizations. They have calls they produce in response to aerial predators and calls they produce in response to terrestrial predators. But as urgency increases, as the risk of predation increases, these calls get noisier. They get less structured. So we're breaking away from the simple harmonic structure we see in calls. Even recruitment calls are more sort of, you know, stacked harmonics versus much noisier um, when uh, their response urgency is increases. So what's that mean? What's really going on here? My son um, learned the trumpet, um, which is really a bad learning curve if you live in a townhome. Um, he's pretty good now. I can't get a sound out of the damn thing that, you know, sounds good, but, but he can. Think about um, your car stereo or of any, any sort of system. Nonlinear systems have a, a, a state space where you sort of turn up the volume a little or put a little more air through something and it gets louder. And then at some point, when you turn your stereo up a little too far, it starts getting degraded in predictably unpredictable ways. You get deterministic chaos. You get rapid amplitude and frequency fluctuations. You get all sorts of things that are predictably unpredictable. Same thing, you know, as you get louder and louder with your trumpet. At some point, everything breaks, unless you're really good. So, acoustically, these acoustic nonlinearities can be diagnosed or seen on spectrograms, and um, there's a whole suite of these. So that might be a normal rhesus coo call. 
Th these would be subharmonics, energy bands between the harmonics. These, this is biphonation, energy bands around the harmonics. This is deterministic chaos, or what sounds like noise, right? Um, energy across, um, uh, across the, the, the spectrum. And then you also have rapid frequency transitions, which might be defined as warbles, things like that. These are all nonlinearities. Now, it turns out that these aren't unique to any given species. They're, if you have a vocal production organ like a syrinx, if you're a bird, or, or a larynx, if you're a mammal, um, you end up getting these sorts of things. And these are remarkably convergent. So I'm going to play some things. You might want to cover your ears. These are horrible sounds. These are from hunters' tapes. Hunters get prey um, or predators, and they um, get screams from them, and they play these back to, 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 to attract predators that they then can shoot, hunt, trap, do whatever they want to. So we're going to listen to screams from different species. So this is a cottontail rabbit, gray fox. I actually heard a mule deer being killed by a coyote once, and it just went on like that for a while. Um, and, you know, all of these are chock full of nonlinearities. Rapid frequency changes, in some cases biphonation, noise or deterministic chaos, um, sidebands, biphonation, etc. These are inevitably produced if you overblow a vocal production system. If you turn up your gain too much on your car stereo. If you put too much air too quickly through your larynx. Let's go back to the marmots, yellow-bellied marmots. Yellow-bellied marmots communicate um, risk by varying the number and rate of their calls. Whistles or chirps are their most common call type. These are individually distinctive. We studied screams. Now, as I said, baby marmots can produce alarm calls the first day they're out of the, the, the burrow, and they continue to produce calls throughout their lives. But these screams are restricted really only to the first about nine, eight or nine days after they emerge. Ma made a bunch of measurements on the screams, looked for the evidence of, of, of what might be called nonlinearities. Um, and uh, look for the evidence of what might be called nonlinearities. So warbles, abrupt frequency transitions, maybe biphonation, maybe subharmonics, maybe deterministic chaos or noise, etc. You know they sound different. You make a bunch of measurements. Screams differ from calls on all measured characteristics. I mean, if they didn't, we were doing something wrong. They're longer in duration and they're lower in frequency. Now that's interesting because animals, there's an inevitable relationship between the lowest frequency an animal can produce and um, its body size. And these are little pups, and they're producing low-frequency vocalizations. So the function of these screams is, is still quite interesting, and maybe these animals are trying to bluff their size. There might be other functions as well. These screams um, frequently had deterministic chaos. Many of them had subharmonics. Some had biphonation. Most had warbles. They're highly individualistic. Are, they, are these more evocative than alarm calls? So anecdotally, the fact that a mom would come out and look at me and show me your teeth um, and be this far away suggests that they are, but let's do an experiment. So here we bait animals to a location. We're looking at the time foraging. We broadcast an alarm call, a call from, an alarm call from a pup and a scream from a pup. And in that first 15 seconds, they respond, but then they recover over time and go back to baseline foraging over the, over the next minute or so. And what we find is that this comes out as either, either as a main effect or an interaction that screams uh, from pups suppress foraging longer. They're more evocative. When I first was hearing screams, before I noticed that they um, had all these nonlinearities in them, I was obsessed about the length. And um, these days, I don't think uh, schools teach music anymore, at least public schools teach music anymore. But when I was a kid, um, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, you know, we had a music teacher and we had a chalkboard and we had that thing that you put the chalk on and the music teacher would like draw the staff across the board and, you know, it would make horrible sounds. And I figured, well, maybe that alarm calls are just zoop, zoop, and screams extend that in some way. So what we did was we generated, we synthesized an average scream. This is an average marmot scream. And then once we have the equation for this, we can make it smaller, make it longer, and we could ask, does scream duration, given the same scream, just varying only in duration, influence responsiveness? And it turns out that long screams um, suppressed foraging more than either um, short screams or alarm calls. So there's something about duration that might be important here too. Now this isn't just about marmots. Nonlinearities are common in highly aroused animals and, and, and highly aroused parts of animals' vocalizations. Oh, 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 oh. 
you know, that, that, that gets a little rough, that gets a little nonlinear. Dog barks. Dogs are interesting. You know your dog when he's happy or she's happy and when she's like upset. And that upset, they're a little raspier, they're a little, they're different. Macaque screams, piglet screams. This gets you into a really dark literature really fast because there's a, there's a whole animal welfare literature for production animals. And, and the whole production animal thing is how do we, you know, use sounds and vocalizations to try to make, improve the welfare. So, you know, you have studies where this is the sound of the goat being walked to being castrated. This is the sound of the goat being castrated. This is the sound of the goat after castration. Same things for pigs, dark literature. Very interesting. Um, piglets and goats, I actually think, um, get more aroused before and during. It's like, ee, ee. but if you really think about dogs too, when they're really scared, really scared, you know, they almost become a little more tonal rather than, than, than the rough nonlinear stuff. So I'm going to suggest that the sound of fear, or maybe more generally arousal, is nonlinear. Um, and that these nonlinearities may be evocative because they're to some extent unpredictable. I mean, they're predictably unpredictable. And this creates an honest signal of fear. So when you overblow something, when you get too scared, you create a whole suite of predictably unpredictable sounds. And this is sort of unbluffable. OK, so now let's take a normal marmot alarm call. Let's add a little bit of noise to it. And let's um, subtract a little bit of noise to it. Strictly, because of the rapid onset and offsets, this is nonlinear. But let's just see what happens when we add noise to this call. I want, to, I want you to listen to it. And particularly, I want you to listen to um, here how that second one was a little raspier. Let's see if I can play it again. Here how it's a little raspier. That's not just I'm over-recording it. It's raspier. That's the, that's the noise in that call. Turns out with calls with noise suppressed, with noise added, suppressed foraging um, compared to normal calls or calls with silence added, suggesting there's something about the addition of noise that was important. So I got cocky and said, hey, I got data because we collect data, right? I got data on um, adult marmots, and I know their stress levels because we you know, collect their poop, and my big freezer's full of this stuff, and database is full of this stuff. We got data. And I said, let's, let's see if, 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 if stress marmots produce noisier calls. Um, so what we found was sort of the opposite. We know that scared marmot pups produce noisy screams, but if anything, scared adult marmots, particularly males, produce maybe more tonal or articulated calls. So I'm going to call this the, the, the make my day hypothesis, you know, or Johnny, come clean your room now hypothesis. When you really want to get that message across, maybe you articulate it really clearly. Um, alarm signals have multiple functions, and maybe these more articulated calls might help better communicate the desired message. We're exploring this more, but that's where we are with that now. Now, this is not just a story about marmots. Um, Nonlinearities, specifically rapid downshifts in noise, decrease relaxed behavior in Caribbean gray-tailed grackles. So here, this was the result from a field biology quarter um, class where we said, OK, let's just s come up with completely arbitrary sounds. Let's just have a control sound of a bird that maybe they're not, not familiar with. Let's look at a a pure tone, a pure tone that goes up, a pure tone that goes down, and a pure tone that ends with noise. And these synthetic, completely synthesized nonlinearities lead to different sorts of responses in accordance with the nonlinearity and fear hypothesis. And in white-crowned sparrows, too. Same thing. And if you want to get really cocky, you go to a species that doesn't even say anything, and you say, are nonlinearities important for non-vocal skinks? And the answer is, well, Maybe not the noise, but a jump down vocalization, the, the jump down sound, that, that synthetic sound, leads to a, a unique response in skinks as well. Completely arbitrary sounds. OK. So talking about this, some of these results, giving a popular talk on campus. Um, and I said, I bet this works for, for, for you know, humans and music and movie soundtracks and stuff. And a guy comes up to me and says, introduces himself. His name is Peter Kay. And he says, you know, um, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm get working on a PhD now, and uh, I'm studying emotional communication in, in, in music and, and soundtracks, and I'm uh, you know, a, a soundtrack composer and a musician, and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I've been troubled that most of the theories of music and emotions and communication are all 
sort of devoid of biology, but I think you're right. I think that this biological idea, and he's thinking about the biological basis of emotional communication. He said, I bet you're right. And I said, hey, you want to collaborate? And he's like, well, I don't really know how to do experiments. I go, I do. Um, and I go, and not only that, we have great undergraduates here, so let's get, let's get an undergraduate to help us out with this. So we got an undergraduate to help us out with this, and we went and we looked at, um, we asked the question, if humans respond like non-humans to nonlinear sounds, then composers and audio engineers can capitalize on this to evoke emotions. So we wanted to know whether emotionally evocative soundtracks incorporate noise and other nonlinear analogs. So we use databases to find the best war movies like Platoon and Patton and Apocalypse Now. These are sort of European, US European popular databases, but this is what we did so far. You know, adventure movies, horror movies, gotta have Psycho, right? Um, dramatic movies. And then we went in and we said, let's just take, you know, a clip from that like iconographic scene, boat sinking, man being walked to his execution. You know, um, you can, guess what psycho one is. Uh, and we, 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 we sort of scrutinize spectrograms. Now, what we're looking at is we're not looking at the output from a, from a dynamic system. We're not looking at the output from a nonlinear system. We're looking at some highly created, sculpted, crafted, you know, soundtrack, which includes Foley, you know, sound effects. It includes dialogue. It includes um, diagenic sounds or background sounds. It includes music from one or more instruments. And it also, in, you know, includes other sorts of, you know, effects um, and filters and, you know, whatever. So we looked at these, these spectrograms of these and we said, you know, can we convince ourselves that we would call this, if this were produced by a biological system, that we could call this a, um, a subharmonic or we could call this, you know, deterministic chaos or noise or whatever. So here's an example. Janet Leigh's first scream is a real scream. Now there's all sorts of lore about that. It's a real noisy scream. There's all sorts of lore about that. Did um, Hitchcock turn off the warm hot water? Um, you know, did she ever go back in the shower again? I don't know what the truth is, but that's a real scream. The rest of them are sort of these you know, dramatic screams you know, more tonal. This is a noisy scream. So we looked at these things and we said, okay, we, we, we can convince ourselves we can do this in a pseudo repeatable way. Let's just turn the crank and, and see what comes out. So what we're looking at here are um, the number of films that had something by genre. So um, black means present, white means not present, and using contingency table tests to say, well, you know, is there something different going on in a particular category? So we find fewer noisy sound effects in sad movies than would be expected by chance, right? That's what that means. So we find that sad films enhance abrupt musical frequency changes while horror films suppress them. We find that sad films enhance musical sidebands while horror films suppress them. We find that horror films use noisy female screams while well, sad films suppress them. Duh, it's not a horror film unless a woman's screaming, right? So, you know, that's interesting. So there's something going on here with noise. So I'm talking with Greg and Brian. And, you know, I'm like, Greg, you know, this is what we found. And I said, you know how to work with people. He goes, I do. He goes, and, and you're a musician and you make me, I, I do, I'm a musician. I, you, know, you, want, you want to collaborate? He's like, yeah, yeah. So let's do an experiment. Let's create, let's compose um, Marmot-inspired music. And let's ask people what they think about it. So Greg and Peter came up with a whole bunch of um, little ditties. Peter at the time, at some time before, did a gig. He said, you know, in 10 seconds you can tell a story. He goes, I had a gig for MTV where we made 10 second movies. And it's like, you can, you can actually communicate something in a 10 second movie. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, the, the music and the scenes, you know, if you put them together in the right way, you can create some impression of something. So we went out and we first created a bunch of music, which, oops, ah, sounded something like this. Now we had a whole bunch of these little ditties and we either played them for 10 seconds or at five seconds something happened. So that's a 10 second one unmanipulated. And then at five seconds we could add something. So that's sort of our, you know, noisy manipulation. We can add frequency up or frequency down. So we had a whole bunch of these different things and then we created a whole bunch of little films. So that was a little frequency down. And, 
we created a whole bunch of little films. And the films were really simple things. So these guys are good musicians. We are collectively bad cinematographers. So someone's walking, they make a left turn. They make a right turn. Someone's reading a newspaper, they turn the page at five seconds. Someone's sitting there, the phone rings, you pick it up. When the music went from, you know, uh, went down and they picked up the phone, you're like, who died? Right, so we're like, this is gonna work, this is gonna work. Um, because together they created something. Turns out, together they didn't create anything, and I'm not gonna talk about that now, because really this was a multimodal experiment, and what really happened, I think, is we blocked things um, by having sort of banal, you know, um, videos and compelling music. So I just wanna talk about the musical um, results now. We asked people um, how aroused they were after hearing these 10 second clips which we defined as, you know, how emotionally stimulating or active do you feel now? And, and what their balance was. How positive or negative, how happy or sad um, did they feel? And we asked them to rate this on a Likert scale that went from negative three to positive three. And what we found was that arousal was enhanced by noise and frequency up, whereas valence, things became more negative um, by the addition of noise and frequency down. So, this marmot-inspired music allows us to, in an experimental way, so in a correlative way, there seems to be something going on, in an experimental way, at least according to self-reporting, there seems to be something going on. So then we got cocky, and we said, okay, let's wire people up, and let's you know, ask a whole suite of autonomic um, questions about this. And what we didn't really think too clearly through, at least initially, is that we wanted to keep the, I was really insistent on keeping the same experimental design so everything is comparable, but the same experimental design actually confounds itself for some of these um, uh, res autonomic responses like changes in heart rate or galvanic skin responses that we're looking at. But the best ones are those that can go on and off really fast and don't really have a latency period after they go on, things like eye muscle movement and mouth muscle movement. There's a literature that looks at how um, facial EMGs can be used to um, look at emotional responses to a variety of things. So what we found was, at least preliminarily, um, that noise is associated with enhanced eye muscle movement. So, okay. Um, Composers and, and, and you know, sound engineers capitalize seemingly on our natural responsiveness to, to these nonlinear vocal attributes to evoke emotions in film soundtracks and, and possibly music. Um, and that's great. People are doing this potentially without knowing it. I keep asking musicians whenever I encounter them, you know, how do you think about manipulating emotions and, you know, what are you thinking about? And, and there's, as I said, there's a whole music literature that doesn't really take a biological basis to thinking about this, but rather um, empirically has discovered um, certain things work, minor tone sounds, you know, scary and depressing and sad, whereas other things don't. Um, and, and, you know, people have sort of intuitively found this. So I think I've sort of cracked the code potentially, or we've cracked the code on, on these nonlinearities and fear, potentially. Um, I, of course, uh, was at the time I was chair of our department, and you know I'm going to all these things that I'm supposed to brief our department on about commercializing ideas, and I'm like, hey, maybe I can patent the sound of fear. So I go to the lawyers, and I'm like, you know, I don't believe in patenting genes, but people do it. Can I patent the sound of fear? They said, no, you can't. I said, why not? It's no different than knowing that a gene functions a certain way. I want to get you know residuals from everyone that uses noise in a scary scene. They said, you can't do that. I go, why not? You can patent genes, which you shouldn't be able to do. And they said, no, you have to make a box or a, a doohickey that identifies it, then you can patent that if people, and people have to buy that. I'm like, I, I just don't get it. Anyway, the lawyers didn't help me. So, so then I'm sort of thinking about, you know, my career trajectory. And what I really want to do now is I want to put people in a tube and scare them. And, and Greg and I are trying to, um, you know, scare them with marmot-inspired music. So Greg and I are trying to figure out ways to put people in tubes and scare them with marmot-inspired music. But that raises the question, is it really noise? And it turns out that someone sort of beat us to it um, in terms of putting people in tubes and scaring them with um, various sounds. Roughness is not noise. Roughness quantifies rapid, really rapid amplitude modulations. Rough sounds have very rapid amplitude fluctuations. And it turns out that using something called a modulation power spectrum 
Roughness occupies a unique acoustic space. Rough sounds look and sound differently than less rough sounds. Screams, it turns out, are rough. So you can say, um, oh God, or oh my God, help me. And if you say it, it looks sort of like this. And if you scream it, it looks sort of like this in this modulation power spectrum. So this is quantifying this, this roughness. And it turns out that these guys did for roughness, what we want to do for another suite of nonlinearities is put people in tubes, um, have rough sounds and non-rough sounds broadcast to them and look at you know, activity in the amygdala and other parts of the brain. And it turns out that, that people hearing rough sounds have more amyg amygdala activity um, than non-rough sounds. And when they hear non-rough sounds, they have auditory cortex, but not amygdala activity. So this is not coming from a biological you know, perspective on this. And Greg's doing some work right now thinking about associations between roughness and noise and other nonlinearities. Um, so there's a future to this work. So stay tuned in the future and one or both of us will share that with you later on. But for now, let's take a stretch and think about the take home messages from this because I've talked a lot um, and talked about a lot of different things. And I think I want everyone to be comfortable with the fact that ain't nature grand, that, that isn't it cool that there's variation in life. Marmot alarm calls communicate degree of risk, not predator type by a bunch of different mechanisms. Um, maybe we can understand why this mechanistic diversity is there. Um, maybe we can't, but um, there isn't one way to cook an egg. Um, and we see a lot of mechanistic diversity out there. Alarm calls may be individually distinctive. I'm sold on that. Um, and this distinctiveness allows receivers to assess caller reliability. Again, I'm sold on that, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, we, we need to understand why we have different ways to do that. Um, it's generally important to assess caller reliability. There are multiple ways of doing so, but why do we see some ways in some situations and other ways in other situations? Don't know. Screams contain nonlinearities. This effectively communicates fear. Fearful and emotionally evocative sounds are characterized by noise and other nonlinear acoustic attributes. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of, we're in the award season now, right? People make money off this stuff. So in theory, although I haven't figured out how to do this, you can go from studying marmots in the mountains to maybe living in the hills uh, around LA. But I haven't, I haven't capitalized on that one yet. So I'd be delighted to open it up for discussion now. Thanks for listening. And um, I think that we have you know, ways of thinking about the biological basis of at least one emotion, fear. I don't know why I cry at movies. I don't know about sadness. I don't know how to study sadness. I know how to study fear. And I think you know, fear is nonlinear. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, Yellow-bellied marmots are not the most social of the marmots, um, yet reliability assessment's important. As species of marmots, ground squirrels, and prairie dogs get more social, as they live in bigger group sizes, as they interact with more animals repeatedly, the levels of their vocal individuality increase. Kim Pollard was a, district, a PhD student of mine who looked at this years ago. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it works really well. So there's some statistics you can use to quantify individuality at least. And individuality increases almost monotonically with group size in, in, in suggesting that animals that ha, you know, need to discriminate among more individuals are selected to, to do so. We didn't do the playback experiments for all the species, but on the production side, so yes. I think it's always useful to understand if someone's lying to you or not. It's always useful to extract cues from the environment. And even if animals aren't living in tight social groups, they might still hear others, but there does seem to be selection for individuality um, as group size increases. So they're still interacting with the same individuals enough to be able to kind of calculate some kind of reliability score for that individual? Potentially. We haven't done the experiments on the other species, but on the production side of things, we see the individuality increasing, yeah. which suggests that maybe and you know you could you could look at that discriminability yeah. 
um, and, and look at that, how, how they respond. The studying reliability observationally doesn't work in my system. Experimentally, it's a bear. Um, so we haven't gone on and done those with other species yet. So um, <clears throat> maybe it's just you know, brain atrophy in the course of a sabbatical or postprandial sonolence, but um, it seemed to me that uh, I, I didn't follow your reasoning with regard to your explanation of the reliability results. It seems to me there's a piece missing there. So um, if I know <clears throat> that an individual is reliable, and I continue to forage, as your results indicate, then it must be that I have some, I can rely on some additional piece of information that makes it safe for me to forage more. Right? So um, that is, I need to know that the threat is not imminent at the time of the first call. So, you know, if a student runs down the hall screaming, guy with a gun, guy with a gun, right? Um, and you know we know that student to have you know stability issues, right? Then we might maybe poke our head out and look around, right? But if it's the chair of the department running down the hall screaming "guy with a gun, guy with a gun," and we have great confidence in her, we don't poke our head out in the hall and look around. We take you know a base of action immediately, right? So if the marmots are continuing to forage when a reliable caller gives an alarm. It must be the case that they know that something else is going to happen before they're in immediate danger. Now, maybe what happens, and here the you know the limitations of your observational data and the ecological constraints that shape that may you know make the question unanswerable. But but presumably it's something like if I know that Brooke is a reliable caller and she gives an alarm call, then I can keep foraging because I trust that she'll let me know when I really need to move, right? Um, it's not that I need to gather more information. It's that I know something else has to happen before I have to run. So let me take three steps back and say that it took me a while to figure out how to really study variation in response to alarm calls. It's extremely easy to broadcast a call and scare animals out of sight, in which case you don't have any variation to look at. So, you know, we had to bait them, we had to put the speaker a fixed distance away. We couldn't play it too loud or too soft. So we found that sweet spot where we have variation. Um, there are a couple of animals we sort of went through and started going back and trying to analyze the responses of everyone to our control sounds, for example, that it turns out never made it to any data set because they just always disappeared to everything we played back. Um, but there were only a few. But everyone else, there were variable responses. So these aren't the most terrifying vocalizations. So maybe there's something with that. But the point is, they always looked up immediately. And then maybe they did need something else. And if they didn't get that something else, um, then they went back to, to foraging and resumed foraging. But it was different based on the experimentally manipulated reliability. The, it, was, it, was, it was different based on the degradational cues. It was different based on the age-related things, all in consistent ways where the, reli the really reliable situations, they looked, they looked, but then they said, oh, well, maybe nothing's really here, which, again, I'm perplexed as well, but my only way of thinking about this is those unreliable individuals or situations are unreliable specifically because you don't really know what's going on. So yes, the system could be set up to need additional information, and we didn't do that experimentally, um, but it also is possible that if you don't really know what's going on, you need to put more effort into figuring it out, figuring it out yourself. I don't know. Does anyone hear a question? I, I'm not sure that answers your question, but uh, again, I'm, I don't have a clean answer other than that's how I'm sort of thinking about it. Yeah, that was your thesis as I understood it to start with, that there has to be some, the system, in order for that to be adaptive, it must be the case that that reliable individuals provide additional information that makes it safe for me to forage in this context. As I can count on them screaming again, right? Um, or screaming more urgently, or something like that. Whereas an unreliable individual, I'm just not sure how imminent the threat is. So if the, uh, if the reliable individual doesn't keep calling, then... Yeah. So you're saying that 
Because if it were that the threat is imminent and I entirely trust the message, that's the chair of the department running down the hall screaming about someone with a gun, right? Then I don't just keep doing what I'm doing, right? Um, so it has to be the case that if the individual is reliable, that's the first in a chain of communication. Now the problem with that potential explanation is you said the modal number of calls is one, right? So I don't know what that additional piece is. When there's something there, there's typically more than one call. Okay, so maybe that's what it is, which is that but we play, reliable we, individual one, and then I hear reliable yeah. individual So we, we play a couple calls back, and then nothing after that. That's how we could look at change over time. I think we played four calls back, rapidly paced calls, high-risk situation, and then nothing. From so, the same individual? Well, for the reliability ones, we yeah. played different calls from the same individual for the, for, uh, that were either trained to be reliable or trained right, to be unreliable. Right, right, right. So yes. So... Um, in nature, the lack of that additional information may be the tell. That's a nice way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the experiment is pretty anal. And then the question is how you interpret it. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so about the um, effects of or the function of noise and other nonlinear acoustic attributes. So. Um, I'm trying to compare this, the framework you're proposing with uh, Oren and Rendell's affect induction model, in which the, the, what, what determines the acoustic properties of calls is, is the, the affect that they induce in the listener. So, so, so my question is, um, do these attributes, things like noise and so forth, are they honestly signaling the emotional state of the caller, or is it the, 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 the functional basis of the acoustic properties is to um, reliably induce an a, a, a fear in, in the listener. I don't know. I think, I think the caller. So I actually like, um, I mean, you know, if, if you've read Gene Morton's work and read, you know, Drew's stuff, the, 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 that I'm quite sensitive to those things and I like the idea that there may be certain situations that produce certain sorts of vocalizations. These vocalizations may have meaning. Um, both Gene and Drew and, you know, uh, discount the idea that other, that there's any information contained in these calls. I think that's silly. I think that um, the approaches and the questions they're asking are quite complementary with information-centered approaches. So I don't know whether the goal, whether selection, I mean, all, the, the function of all vocalizations is to manipulate the behavior of a receiver, period. Um, but this may be doing it in a very unbluffable, honest way. Um, because if you really are scared, you go, Wah! you know, and you have a, a, a noisy scream or something, that's kind of, I mean, maybe you can train yourself to give noisy screams, but if you're really scared, it's gonna come out in a unique, predictably unpredictable way, I think. So, I don't know how to answer the question other than I think that signals should be designed to manipulate the behavior of others, that there may be particular situations where systems are overblown. When those systems are overblown, certain sounds are going to be produced and those may have responses in others. Um, and that I think this is not incongruent with thinking about information either. I mean, from a receiver's perspective, the information of hearing someone screaming is, someone's having a bad day, maybe I should be a little concerned. Or my kid's being killed, maybe I should be concerned. Now, pups scream for about nine days, I've never heard a pup being killed by a, a fox scream. So I've never heard natural screams. I've only heard screams when we've been gently holding them and holding their bums and they scream in our face and say, like, ugh. And we try to turn on recorders and record them. So, but I mean, if you trap birds, you know, you take a bird, it screams, et cetera, et cetera. Um, did you ever see anything that you thought was intentional deception? <sighs> so, Don Owings and I used to talk about this all the time because Don's, because, because California ground squirrels are lying, cheating little scumbags, right? Um, marmots, maybe not so. Um, but there's all sorts of, you know, false alarm calls in, in, in those guys. Every once in a while when an animal's being chased, in, in, a, in a real chase, we don't see a lot of aggression. Um, but every once in a while when an animal's being chased, the animal being chased will alarm call. And almost inevitably the animal chasing will stop and look around. What sort of, how complex is that deception? 
the animal being chased is scared. They only really have a one word vocabulary. You know, what do you do? You scream, you know, you give an alarm call. So, um, functionally, that's deception. Functionally, it gets the animal off your tail. Um, the frequency of that is very rare compared to California brown squirrels. So, um, but, but it happens. The deception, though, could be in the, I mean, so what's the function of screams? It could be to bluff and say you're bigger. It could also be to tap into the predator's maternal, paternal care systems, um, the way this little squirrel, you know, tapped into mine. It's like, oh my god, I heard it, you know, because their kids produce those sounds too. But, you know, this isn't even convergent. It's just an inevitable byproduct of blowing air too quickly through your, across your, your vocal cords. So we've done some excise syrinx experiments, and those aren't published yet. But it um, turns out that if you, or excise syrinx, or excise vocal cord experiments. So people have looked at the vocalizations in birds by taking out syrinx seeds and blowing air through them and producing sounds and, you know, whatever. And you can get velocities and you can produce sounds and then you can overblow it and then you get sort of other chaotic sounds including nonlinearities. So we did this with marmot pups to see if we could get sounds out of, get screams out of marmot pups if we sort of overblow the system and it sort of goes from a whistle to a, a scream-like broken down nonlinear sound. Um, to do that in adults, because you know the question is why do they only do it for the first nine days and there are a bunch of reasons including you know maybe there's such rapid development in their vocal tract that vocal tract isn't as susceptible or likely to produce these, required figuring out how to get really rapid air velocity pumping through, but eventually we got screams out of adults too, um, dead excised larynxes. Um, so, you know, um, these are in some sense are, on, are, are, you know, could be tapping into the psychological, you know, psyche of, of, of predators as well. Um, and then there are other potential. I mean, they're, they're because they're unpredictably unpredictable because they're chaotic, um, they can be difficult to habituate to. And then not only will they capture attention, they'll keep attention. So these are all not quite mutually exclusive reasons for why animals may be screaming in the function of screams. So I think there's interesting potential bluffing going on there if they're making themselves look bigger or sound bigger. Greg and, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add well, uh, two things. One I wanted to uh, add anything. Uh, add a, um, <clears throat> the affect induction issue. Um, I think one uh, one thing I would add to your answer is that I think their main point, or one of their main points, was if you're going to try to explain the function of signals, you don't want to start off with the high level conceptual functional referential explanation. You want to see if you can explain the behavioral data by looking at it, it, whether it's just um, some sort of attempt to induce an affect to cause a certain kind of behavioral pattern without having any conceptual representation. So I think if you if you ask Rendell, he doesn't think that there's no information strictly. I know they've written things. Silly things. Some silly things. But I, I think um, that obviously he, he recognizes there's information in some kinds of calls and stuff. But I, I think the main point is just not go there first and that you can you can explain a lot of behavior without invoking that kind of concept. And he's going after chimpanzee and see first. I think, right? uh, but I wanted to ask you about the uh, Vancouver marmots with the phonological syntax. And um, We broadcast calls back. So we have five different types of vocalizations. And you broadcast them in different orders, and you get different responses. And we went no further than that. Right. So I mean, it seems like if there really are syntactic rules, that implies there's some, probably some sort of functional reference there. Otherwise, why? Well, it could be different kinds of risk. It's riskier. Well, okay, so then, then, then what's functional reference? Is it predator specific or is it risk specific? It just seems like a lot of complexity and rules for something you could do a lot easier. So I'm just wondering, hmm. is, it, is there a rule? But you don't know for sure. There's a rule of how things are combined. We didn't have enough vocalizations to sort of crack it yeah. correlatively. We just sort of played around with playbacks. Yeah. Um, you know, again, when people typically talk about functional reference, it doesn't have to be, but I mean, you know, they're typically talking about predator A versus predator B or whatever, right? So you could have higher risk situation going to a lower risk situation. You could have lower risk going to a higher risk. So I think even without having, and if you want to call that referential, you could, but um, it's not predator specific in the same way. So you could have 
different syntactical rules going from high to low or low <coughs> to high without necessarily saying this predator or that predator. So, you know, if you pop up right next to a Vancouver Island marmot, it'll give it a vocalization and if you're far away walking towards it. So, same stimulus, you know, quite a bunch of different responses. Uh, someone over here, you had a question? Yeah. Yeah, I was just curious about the sort of unblockability of the scream and can you actually tell the difference between like, for instance, in a human, can you, is there an acoustic difference between a scream that's genuinely evoked by fear versus if you just tell someone, scream like you're afraid and they do it on purpose? Greg? They're not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Janet Leigh's first scream was a real scream. That was a good scream. I mean, all I know is comm majors that come into the lab and you tell them to scream. <laughs> you really have to do two things to them. <laughs> I don't mean like that. <laughs> <laughs> Some people just aren't going to scream. Um, one, one trick I found was um, I have um, little meters that go into the red and I say, look, you have to make it go into the red, so do whatever you have to do. And then that actually gets better results, but um, there, I think there's some sort of difference when that affect isn't really there and then they have to volitionally do it. Is that difference related to the roughness of the sound? Is, is it what? Related to roughness or the nonlinearity of the that's the thing is that they end up going ah, instead of what they might otherwise do if they were really um, induced, right? So they can be loud and tonal, and they're not as. I mean, I haven't done the experiment where I have the real screams to compare, but my punch in listening to them is that they're not actually induced enough to scream in a way that gets roughness and chaos and all that. Can you think of an ethical way of getting that? Well, <laughs> or why, making them watch horror movies. And There's a, a paper just is um, coming out, and they got stuff from YouTube when people are really scared, and there are lots of instances where people get frightened on, you know, um, spontaneously, and it was filmed. There's one. What about those fright rooms and things around Halloween? Yeah, there's, there's a thing I saw where a guy is uh, dressed up like a plant in a mall, <laughs> <laughs> and somebody walks around the corner and he goes, Rah! Like, and people scream, and it's spontaneous, and they're noisy, and they sound different than the kinds of screams you might get if you just ask people to yell or scream. I guess I'm thinking of you're analyzing movie data. You you might see that a Hollywood actor who's professionally supposed to be faking their emotions will be better at faking yes. an emotional scream than your average undergrad in the lab. Definitely. Can you still tell the difference between that versus, say, you know, an actress who maybe, I think we're not, was scared of in, real, in reality? The, the problem is that one of the ways that really, really good actors provide realistic portrayals is that they put themselves in the minds they set, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, they themselves, as it were, in order to sound frightened. Um, so the only way to bluff it is to genuinely create right. fear? I, I mean, we, we can't tell the difference by looking at a, a professional performance. You, uh -huh. you don't know whether what they're doing is simply emulating with great fidelity or actually experiencing <coughs> the state, right? Because a professional may be able to induce the state. And that's that. Yeah. Um, I have a similar-ish question. Um, so, just thinking about sort of the way you've described uh, fear calls earlier, sort of just pushing too much air through, you know, a tube or whatever, um, and thinking about different human emotional experiences, I think that there are some shared features of both maybe aggressive interactions and fearful interactions. So if you're, you know, like screaming at somebody, you're still sort of blowing out the, the you know, the system past whatever threshold it is. So I was wondering, um, you know, whether or not you see any sort of acoustic similarities between, you know, aggressive vocal signals that are made in, you know, uh, intraspecific conflict and whether or not that's So Gene, to great it. question. So Gene Morton, and the reason we sort of have these rapid frequency ups and rapid frequency downs included in there, is Gene Morton suggested years ago that, and sort of channeling Darwin, that and thinking about sort of um, how uh, signals are ritualized, that um, typically when you have an aggressive display, animals make themselves look big, their hair or feathers get pilo erect, um, and you know, it's like, and the vocalization goes down. 
as opposed to when you're backing up, you're making yourself look small and it's like, ee! you know, the vocalization goes up. So it's really hard to sort of, you know, train yourself to go, ee! you know, and make yourself, you know, go up. When, so there's, and he calls this motivation structural rules, that there's a, and the, the, the support for that's not so great, actually. But nonetheless, um, we sort of designed those in with these rapid ups and downs, which is why we have those. If anything, it seems that um, the rapid downs are a little more evocative than the rapid ups, but I think there's more room there to explore. Molly and then Dan. Um, I was just wondering about the relationship between um, selection for the effective state itself, like the internal effective state and the expression of that. Um, and I assume that the effective repertoire of marmots is different than that of other animals, especially you know thinking about our own species and um, whether there's something like how closely tied these two are. Whether there is any evidence from I don't know imaging studies or anything like that 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 there is some sort of experience of a particular affect without the communicative. Don't know, which is why which is why I don't know how to study the sound of sadness. You know, if anything, depression and sadness are come in, be quiet, don't say anything, rather than, so you can evoke things in fearful ways. Um, you know, I'm not saying animals aren't sad, I just don't know how to study it, um, experimentally at least, um, because, you know, what is the sound of silence, you know? Um, Darwin said that, you know, thought that animals didn't have highly complex communication and it was all emotional, so there, there was, a, he, said that there's a link between, or proposed there's a link between emotional states and the sounds that come out. But um, I think it's difficult to know, and when you think about different emotions, I don't know how you study those in, in a comparative way, typically either. Um, I think I picked the low-hanging fruit. So, um, I mean, there might be for some other emotions, but I, I don't know for others. So, you know, can an animal be scared and not say anything? Well, I mean, animals don't necessarily have to alarm call. And in fact, um, Using microphone arrays, we could identify really precisely where specifically animals were when they emitted alarm calls, and we knew exactly where their burrows were. And unlike some other species, yellow-bellied marmots run back to safety before they emit vocal, you know, alarm vocalizations. So they're not calling when they're in the most exposed places. So if anything, they're managing that risk and not exposing themselves and saying, I'm here, eat me, um, until they're back at safe locations. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think that when you think about emotions writ large, I don't know how to look at those in lots of different species. Um, for the fearful ones, I think we can have a tool that we might, you know, look at, and that's how I've, that's what I've played with. So with the marmots, are you, just so I understand, are you saying that their relocation after they've experienced the fearful event and then their vocalization kind of indicates that there's there's some divorce between... It's not necessarily a reflexive fear response and immediately um, saying things. Nonetheless, there's, you know, they, they call louder, I think, when they're more scared, et cetera, et cetera. They call, they, 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 they can dynamically change their communication of perceived risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and if they're in a safe position, you know, then they'll, they'll call. You had a question? Uh, yeah, it was, I was, it was a great talk. Um, and I was also thinking about how if it's possible to, or if you, if you thought about extending this into situations where you have multiple individuals, say like mobbing, or multiple indi individuals responding to some fear stimuli. So mobbing where, calls are really interesting. Where you could see maybe the difference between the signal as a pure expression of an individual state versus actually you get individuals coordinating to create noisy signals by changing relative to other audio other members in a group to see if they're going to I don't know if mobbers I don't know if mobbers are doing that but mobbing are typically broadband rapidly paced mm -hmm. sounds we worked with the possible birds on a field biology quarter years ago in Australia possible birds are really cool they're like in groups of 12 and they're hyper social desert birds and um, you can and they're smart and they you know, like come down and they respond to playbacks which is my definition of smart any bird that doesn't can't be studied isn't smart in any event you know so you, you put things down and they come down and they investigate it so we were playing mobbing calls back to them and the the student group kind of melted down in the middle of this which was too bad because we were teasing apart the different attributes of a mobbing call so we played with the rate we played with the bandwidth because mobbing calls are very noisy and high bandwidth, which might aid in localization. 
turns out it seems, and we play, we're playing with the dominant frequency, so it, it seems that it's not the bandwidth that elicits that response in mobbing calls. It seems it's the tempo and potentially the dominant frequency. It's not conclusive. I don't know, I know of nothing, I know of no mobbing situations where individuals are creating a sound effect in the sense that different individuals are singing different roles to create something. Rather, one or more individuals are giving these rapidly paced broadband sounds and collectively going and harassing a predator. But mobbing calls are a good one. And they have the, the noisy stuff, which, and, and raspy, easy to localize. But, but interestingly, it's not the, it doesn't seem to be the, the, the evocative thing doesn't seem to be the noisy bandwidth. It's something about the tempo, which itself is interesting. And maybe the dominant frequency.